Hello, I'm Brian Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University. This is a abbreviated one-shot version of Tidyverse approach materials. So if you're looking for a quick introduction, this is a place to go. I am going to move very quickly without pausing too much for explanation, but I will explain why I'm doing that in just a second. So all of my materials related to this content are at my GitHub site, github.com slash Ryan data slash tidyverse underscore approach. When you go to this site, you'll see there are several other uh, lesson materials, but the one I'm going to use today is our tidyverse one shot. Um, if you would like more depth, if you would like to explore any of the topics in further detail, consult those other sessions and there's a full playlist of screencasts for those other materials on YouTube. So all that will be linked uh, from this site and you can, you can find it there. But for this session, I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to move straight through. Uh, use your pause button, use your speed adjustment to slow down and repeat anything uh, that, that you'd like to uh, delve into more detail. But my goal is to produce a very short video that covers the basics. So this is the link, Tidyverse OneShot R. You can click there. You can right click or use whatever method you use to save uh, something from the website to right click on the raw button and save the link as. So the raw button is important because if you save it as a web page, you're going to get a bunch of HTML mixed, in, mixed into the file. What you want is the plain text file that ends in .r. And that way, when you open it up in R, you will have a clean version. Now, I'm using RStudio, uh, as I do in, in pretty much all of my videos. Um, you're not required to do that. You can use base R. Uh, system. You can use any other um, R environment that, that you'd like, but we're in RStudio. So I have just opened up the R Tidyverse OneShot.R uh, file in RStudio. Uh, open it up from wherever you have saved it on your system. Um, and you've got a navigation window down in the bottom right in RStudio. And again, I'm going to move very quickly through this uh, as a fast intro to R, um, and I'm not going to cover all of the code when I get down to around line 200-ish. Um, we're not going to do the, the sort of second part that gets into another detailed data example. Again, the goal here is to, is to produce a very quick, compact version. Um, so uh, we have, just to review RStudio, we have this navigation help down in the bottom right where our files our plots and other things, our help as we see them, will, will show up in the bottom right. We have a, t a pane in the top right that shows us objects in the R environment. It'll also show us history. This, this is less significant on a day-to-day um, -day basis, but it's, it's still useful. Uh, all these are adjustable. We can adjust the size so that we can focus on our main event. And I've opened the code file, as you've already seen. The code file resides in the top pane. And this is essentially just pre-written R commands. But if we want to run them, we have to convert them to something down below in the bottom left panel, which is the console. So the console is our live interaction with R. And I'm going to start working through these commands uh, at this point. So some examples of commands starting on line 10. Um, also, by the way, just to review all the basics, uh, a comment in an R code file is preceded by a hashtag or octothorpe or pound symbol or whatever you'd like to call that. And um, that indicates that whatever you type there is for human eyes only, uh, not for the computer to, to run the code. So when I say the commands, I'm talking about the stuff that appears in white on my screen. Also, by the way, I have a dark theme on my RStudio. Your default RStudio install probably will start as a white background. Same program, everything runs the same. Okay, so running commands. We can type in the console directly. 
we can type a command. I'm here typing get wd and right up front I've got an error. You notice can't find the function get wd. Um, I'm trying to get the working directory. That's what get wd is an abbreviation for. Um, but R is case sensitive. So if you're coming from any other environment that is not case sensitive, um, you're going to have to get used to that very quickly. The correct command there is a lowercase g. And if I type that with parentheses, it'll show me this is my default directory where my R files are residing. Um, when you're working with your own files, it's important to know where they're going. Um, we can change that directory if we like. Um, you can do that through the menus or you there's a command called setwd. Um, but one easy way to get started is simply to drop data files or code files that you'd like to use into the default R directory that's on your system. Uh, and you can obviously modify that. Uh, the other thing to notice about these commands is I, they're those parentheses, right? So I, if I type it without parentheses, I actually get something very interesting, which is the transparency of the R language. Uh, I see get wd with no parentheses gives me the definition of the function. Now this one is kind of abstract. It's a very low level function of like looking up a something in the file system. So it doesn't look like other R commands, but we're gonna see another example of that just right around the corner. Um, but that's important to note. So when you run a command, Typing the name itself just gives us a definition. Typing the parentheses is essentially asking R to run the command with default arguments. And uh, in just a minute, we'll see what happens when you put things inside the parentheses. Um, so this console is you know, like, like your live interaction. R is coming out of a math environment, math and statistics. So we, we can use the console as a calculator. Um, we can uh, run math operations, um, things like that, square root powers and things like that. So just to show you that that's a live environment um, and those kinds of math functions will all be available uh, when you're writing your R programs as well. All right, another really important feature of R is that it's very easy to create your own functions. So um, this is the transparency and the openness of the R language. Not only is it free, but its open source nature has led to people writing thousands and thousands, maybe 20,000 or so packages at this point um, that contribute to the R ecosystem uh, and make it possible to do all kinds of wonderful things. So let's start out and just create our own function. Um, I'm going to name the function, right? The first thing we're doing here is and I'm going to continue kind of typing myself for a little while so you can see it spelled out slowly. Um, the name on the left is completely arbitrary. That's whatever we want to call it. Uh, this thing that I'm typing next is in R called the assignment operator. Um, it, is, it is roughly equal to an equal sign, but it's a little bit better than an equal sign because it's got a direction. It makes it clear that what comes on the right-hand side is getting put into what's on the left hand side. So the left hand side is the new thing that and it's defined by what's on the right. So we're, we're actually making an arrow. We type that by typing a less than sign and a hyphen. So two characters together. It is also possible to use the arrow in the other direction by typing a hyphen and a greater than sign. Somehow that's less conventional in R, but that also can work. Um, so this is recommended style in R. Uh, there's some cases where an equals will also work, um, but the assignment operator is less ambiguous. It's, it's, it's the way to go in the R, uh, R style coding. So I'm gonna say, what, what is this that, that we're defining? We're gonna define something that is a function, right? So the word function is a, is a command in R that lets us define something. If we're typing in RStudio, we get these nice little helpers as we type something that'll complete things for us and also remind us of you know, how that function is set up, right? So take advantage of these to speed up your, your coding and your programming. Now, I need to have some parentheses, right? In general, we need parentheses when we're, when we're writing these, these commands. So I'm gonna say this function is gonna be a function of two variables 
x and y that's arbitrary i could name them b and c i could name them whatever i like abbott and costello can they can be named that but keep it simple and call it x and y i hit enter all right so here's another important clue to look at in r the greater than uh, symbol that we used to see at the beginning of the line <clears throat> waiting for input in the console has changed to a plus this is an indicator that R is expecting more things to happen, right? We typed something that was incomplete, and R is asking for more so that we can complete this. Now, it turns out in the case of a function, we have to define the function by inserting curly brackets and then inserting the function inside those curly brackets. Now, one thing that R is not terribly sensitive about, it is case sensitive, um, punctuation characters will affect things but spacing not so much right so in the code up above i've got this one step that's spaced out over four lines um, i'm just going to type the formula all on one line here in r that actually does not make a difference so the function that i'm defining is inside the curly brackets and it's x plus y plus one right so i'm just modifying addition so that it gives a number that's not quite what we would expect. Now, what happened when I hit enter now? A couple of things. The caret symbol, uh, uh, well, let me call that the greater than symbol, reappeared. Uh, that's an indicator that we finished what we needed to, to put in for a, a legitimate command. Um, it's waiting for more input now. And if you spotted this up at the top right, uh, something new has been added into the, the workspace. Um, you can ignore this queue. This is just something that I have defined as a quick way to quit R. Um, you might not have anything there, but funky add is new, right? So funky add is now in our workspace. And what's great about this is we just wrote this function and it is a function on the same level as everything built into R already. We can type funky add and it's going to show us the definition of that function. If we type funky add with parentheses, now in this case, we didn't define any defaults. We, we could actually do, a, we could define a default for the function values and have it automatically put something in, uh, but we didn't do that. So if I type it with parentheses, but nothing inside, um, it's gonna give me an error. We didn't actually tell R what X and Y are gonna be. So let's put in two numbers. Uh, let me put in 44 and 33 there. So that's going to be our X and Y. I could spell it out and say X equals 44, Y equals 33. doesn't really matter for this kind of function. Um, now, if we added those together, what would we expect to see? We'd expect to see 77, but our add addition is different now. We've added one more, and it's 78, just to show you that works um, as a live thing. Now, what is... Uh, this look is a very trivial definition of a function, but inside those brackets, you can put whatever you want. A very long step that you know conditionally tests your data, and if the data meets some criteria, transforms it one way. If it doesn't, do something else. Um, and the, the functions can actually save you a lot of time. You know when you're when you're doing complicated processes, and this is how again people start working with R. They end up with some useful bundle of functions that did something new. And hey, they say, let's release it to the world and let other people use it. And this is how R moves very quickly to release new um, exciting content. Okay, so next section is a, a quick uh, sampling of things like sample uh, to show you that R has a very large range of all anything in statistics that you can think of R has it. Um, now I'm going to stop typing out things in the console at this point and I am going to use the shortcut method. There are really two shortcuts that are useful in RStudio. One is to click run up here and you see also the shortcut key control for that is control enter. So to run line 26, which I'm about to do, all I need to do is put my cursor there, hit control enter, and it runs the, the command. So, you know, this is 
the maybe the first major advantage of writing your analysis in code rather than doing it live in the console is you know you you can build up more complicated commands you can be sure that you're not making a little typo you can correct little typos easily um, so uh, aside from the most basic things uh, i would really recommend you know using the code editor to work with your data in r in almost all circumstances okay what's this command we sampled a range of numbers from 1 to 100 and we asked for 10 draws from that sample right so it's going to give us 10 numbers and um, if i run that command again another little shortcut i can use is the up arrow which is going to retrieve my most recent command uh, in this case it ran that with the comment sort of attached to it that's why it came up that way but this is a random sample so every time i run the command uh, it's going to generate a different set of numbers uh, things like that things like uh, st statistics related to the normal distribution or any other uh, type of statistical concept you're you've heard of probably is going to be an r this is a sample of 10 numbers from the normal distribution a random sample from norm and the default in this case is a standard normal distribution which has a mean of zero standard deviation of one Therefore, when you run this command, you're typically going to see numbers between about negative 2 and 2. Uh, it would be kind of rare to see something uh, far away from those. Oops. Um, so we may also want to adjust those default behaviors. And the way to do that in R is to pass parameters. Right. So we, in line 28, this is our first example of this. We are running a random sample from the normal distribution. We want, 10 t want it to happen 10 times, but we want a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20 in this case, right? So we have something um, that's kind of centered around 100 and not too far away from that. You know, again, two standard deviations of the mean covers 95% of the, the uh, distribution. Okay, so I threw these commands at you, but how would we find out in real life about other commands or just more about these commands, things like that? The R help system is very easy to access. It's built in and you can access help for any command by typing a question mark. So if I type question mark sample, uh, you will now see in the bottom right, uh, our help pane has filled in with a description of here's the sample command, here's how it's used. Um, this is a little bit small here, but <clears throat> we have um, the the standard usage, the variable and per variables and parameters that can be modified. Um, some description of how what can go into those arguments. Then it'll go on into further detail. In many cases, often give you some references for um how this was you know uh, developed subtle details all the things that statisticians care about they're kind of in there right if you care about is this uh truly random the way it's pulling the numbers you know you can dig into this and, and get more detail this is very typical of r that the uh, default in implementation of the command is very quick very dry very simple with reasonable defaults um, but actually everything is modifiable and you want to go into the help to discover how you can adjust different parameters. Um, and the last section of any of these help files is going to be typically example commands, right? So if you just want, like, I forgot how to write that command. I just need to see it. Show me an example. Um, go down to the bottom, look at the examples. You probably are going to find something useful there. Um, so also to show you the uh, help for the normal distribution, um, we use that one function that was our norm, but actually it's a it's part of a family of functions on all of the the uh, different things you could do with the normal distribution, quantiles, uh, density functions, um, cumulative probability for normal distribution for you know any other kind of distribution you could think of, um, you will find these. Uh, functions as well. 
Um, so R is very complete, like from a stats point of view. That's kind of all I'm going to say about that part. Um, but if you want more help, uh, you can also click on this home icon in the help tab. There are a few things. There are some full manuals that you can access here on specific topics. Um, there's also this search engine, right? So if I'm looking for anything on, oh, we're going to see the t-test later, but uh, if I'd like to see um, the chi-square test, right? I might search across um, all the packages that are installed for chi-square, and then I can discover uh, here are the R functions that implement that particular technique, right? And often there'll be multiple variants. There's sometimes a little bit to sort through, but you can click on those and get full help there. Okay, so you know, it, again, the day-to-day -day practice of getting no, to know and use R involves using the help for the functions you need to, you know, get all those details right. You're not expected to pull those out of your head, uh, but they're here in the help. Okay, that's that intro section is about, you know, just kind of how R works. Now we're going to get into the tidyverse. Why is the tidyverse uh, important? The tidyverse, you can get material about the tidyverse at tidyverse.org. And further information about all these packages that we're going to look at is uh, here, including uh, function references and things like that. Um, but tidyverse is a group of packages produced by the RStudio people, overseen by RStudio. Uh, who's really the leading developer in the R space. Uh, there's a lot of independent developers, but RStudio is like a big uh, player. And because there are thousands of packages in R, it's very nice to start with one subset that is highly functional, very well supported, very well documented, and is consistent, right? Because different people write different packages in different ways. Um, there is no one correct way to do things in R that applies to all those packages. Uh, but Tidyverse is, is the probably the best starting place like that. So in order to run uh, this material, you would want to do on line 36, install.packages. Uh, when I say packages, right, the, the key about a package is you'll read about it, you'll find out about it, you'll see a web post about, in R you can do this with this package. The name of the package is unique in the R workspace. So tidyverse is the name of this package, uh, actually in this case, a little group of packages. And as long as we know the name, we can type this, type the name, um, and it's gonna pull from the R network online and pull in those packages and install them. Uh, the dependencies equals true is an option that also installs any related packages that these depend on. Uh, probably recommend that you that you use that option. That's why I'm showing that here. Um, I'm not going to run this command because I've already got them installed on my system. Um, but this is how you would get started. To maintain an R system, you want to run this update packages command that uh, looks at everything on your system and will let you know if there's a newer version and it's all open source so you know you can always move to the newer version very easily and I recommend that you do so because if you don't keep up with the versions often enough you, things start to kind of break a little bit I would recommend every couple of weeks or you know whatever the last time you fired up your R um, go in and, and run this command on line 39 update packages all right the packages are installed on our system, uh, but in order to use them in an R session, we have to load them with the library command. And oh, I see it was my mistake. I thought that uh, I had already loaded the, the tidyverse on this particular computer, but I haven't even done that. So I'm going to go ahead and just let it uh, spin for a minute to install those things. Um, hopefully, that won't take take too long. This is now you well now you can see what it looks like when it's uh, actively. Uh, grabbing things and um, it's going to try to install them here. That's a little bit lengthier on a Linux system like I'm running right now. 
uh, than it would be on a Windows system where everything is pre-packaged. So again, I hope that doesn't take uh, too long. While that's that's going on, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about the function references over on the, the Tidyverse site. So we're going to look at, again, these core packages. ggplot does data visualization, and the rest are data manipulation type of packages. Um, but for any of them, you can visit the site that starts with the name of the package, .tidyverse.org. So ggplot2.tidyverse.org has um, all the descriptive material for ggplot2. And they also often usually have a nice cheat sheet that gives you the main commands in a very concise format. Um, it starts out with some descriptive examples, but when you go to the reference section, you can get further detail on all of the commands. This is the same stuff that's in the help that when you say question mark, the name of the commands, but it can be a lot nicer to browse and, and get those descriptions online like this. Um, so we are going to see, uh, for example, geom point is going to come into play in a minute for our scatter plots. Um, and so we want to know exactly how that function works. Geom click on it and you will see uh, a fuller description there, including examples. And one advantage here is the examples actually have the plots uh, displayed which you won't get in the text help um, in R. Okay, so I'm still cranking a little bit uh, through through some of my packages. Um, you may want to click ahead uh, 30 seconds or so on this video. Um, I should have checked that before I started. This kind of defeats one of my, costing me a two, couple of minutes of um, compressed time on the video, but uh, unfortunately, um, it's going to be easier to keep this going than to stop and start again. moving pretty rapidly so there, there aren't that many pieces this is uh, what happens when you when you ask for all of the dependencies um, so there's actually you know quite a bit of uh, dependencies going on um, what we're going to do once this is loaded is we're going to attach a data set that is present in um, in the ggplot2 package. That's the diamonds data set. And it's information about 50,000 diamonds prices and weights. And so when that is, um, is, is ready, we will, we will get that going. While this is running, I'll say a couple of words about the differences between the um, Windows, Mac, and Linux versions. So, you know, the computer here that I record on is a Linux machine. If you were running on Linux, what I would recommend you do when you install R stuff is use your distribution's version of R. That's just going to make it much easier to keep up with, um, with updates and things like that. Um, I can see it just finished the, the ggplot2 part of the install, which is probably the, the larger one. Um, the uh, Mac install, you know, is you go, uh, actually while we're, we're doing that, I'll go to the um, R project site. So this is uh, an unplanned aside introduced by the, the, the installation delay. But to actually get R, these links are all on the 
the tidyverse page that we started from um, but you go to rproject.org and I would recommend that you install R as a standalone thing first before you start you install R Studio. It just gives you greater control in the long run of the versions you're running. So at rproject.org you can go in and click on this download R is, is probably easiest. Uh, it will list for you the network of R servers around the world. You can pick your favorite place or you can use the first one which routes you to a nearby one that is performing well. So if you want to do it fast just click the first one it'll take care of that for you. And you'll see this download for Linux that's what I'm saying don't do that one. If you're running Linux use your distrib search for it in your in your package distribution uh, system and install from there. Uh, download for Mac gives you one recent file and you know that's the usual Mac process just download the file and click on it and kind of you know drag it over like you have to do on a Mac um, and for Windows um, I, I want to be clear about this one is as it says here this is what you want to install for the first time is this base to start out all you need is base uh, there are other things listed here but just take base uh, later if you get into a couple of extended packages you might also need to install this R tools if that ever happens it'll prompt you say you're gonna need R tools for this um, the contrib part is I'm just gonna call that outdated you don't really need those um, everything else you can install from inside R itself once you get base so click on base and click download R um, R studio is a layer that runs on top of the R software itself so if you go to the R studio site go to products or download you just basically are going to navigate and keep clicking in to look for the free desktop uh, there is a commercially so supported version I'm guessing you probably don't want that uh, but there's always going to be a free version here you can download that it's going to recognize your operating system in, in many cases and prompt you for the right version um, this one is not going to be in a Linux repository because it's not fully um, compliant like that I guess would be the easy way to say it so here you would have to click a Linux version and install it separately from your regular package process but um, otherwise the Windows and Mac are straightforward download it click it click through the options and you'll have our studio on your system okay so that's an aside I'll put a little navigation in the um, video to to jump ahead we have finished our installation so again apologies for the delay now our library tidyverse command should work All right so again to load it into active memory it's got to be installed we had to install it and it mentions that we've got these several packages that come in um, I've talked about the help enough I think at this point uh, to load data to load data that's in an R package all we need is the name so data diamonds brings it in the name is diamonds uh, to get information about the package we can say question mark diamonds this is the prices of over 50,000 round cut diamonds um, and another thing I'm going to do for simplicity is to attach the diamonds now this uh, data set let me let me use this command names diamonds which shows us the names of the variables in the data set the so if I want to look at the carrot weight that's being reported in this data set and I type carrot it's gonna say oh we we can't find that why is that R can handle multiple data sets at once this is a big plus it's a it's a nice feature but it means it's not gonna make an assumption for you uh, in order to refer to the carrot variable inside the diamonds data set we have to use this dollar sign notation and say diamonds dollar sign carrot and now it's going to print out some data for us at least the first thousand rows uh, first thousand entries right and then it 
it sort of says there's a lot more here we're not going to print it on screen for you if I want to avoid having to every time I refer to a variable put diamonds dollar sign in front of it uh, I can attach the data set and that makes a um, I don't know why that minimized uh, makes the diamonds data the default data set for the current session okay now working with the data so now we're going to kind of rapidly run through basic data operations and a few statistical tests and conclude with how to import your own data from outside of R because I know that for most of you getting started requires that step I haven't talked about that step yet but it's coming right at the right at the end um, so we can think of this data as a, as a giant matrix uh, like um, and the data viewer here is is adequate in R studio if you actually click on the diamonds up here you'll see uh, a view of the data that fits at least some of the data on screen here so we've got columns at the the head of the columns is the variable name and then each row is one observation um, so one basic way to refer to to data is just by the row and column number of the cell right so if I just want to see the first row and first column I can say diamonds one one note that that's in square brackets not parentheses um, and that's going to pull out okay that's the carat weight of the first diamond right um, if I want to look at a range I can use this colon notation so rows 1 through 10 columns 1 through 6 and if I want to look at everything except a certain column or row I can use a negative number so if I say minus 1 uh, in line 58 this is rows 1 through 10 all the columns except for column 1 so we'll see caret disappears once we ask for that version um, you know often that's that's the quickest way of accomplishing something uh, we can also refer to things by the column names you know there there we can and we'll see some tools to like select and filter in, in a we'll, we'll get closer to something like that in a bit but this is the fundamental thing uh, we saw the names command um, we we have a way to list objects in our workspace which is just ls and that shows us that as of now we've got that funky add we've got that Q as I said that's my own function that's left over um, I just leave that's a default thing I leave in there uh, and the diamonds data set right um, if we want in now let's actually look at like data operations we want some information about these variables uh, one starting place is to use the summary command so summary of diamonds provides a quick view of every variable in the data set for a numeric variable it's going to give you know the median the mean some you know the basic descriptive statistics for a categorical variable it's reporting here the count the number of items in each category so diamond can have five cut ratings uh, there's 1610 fair diamonds up through 21,000 ideal cut diamonds so you can do that you can do that for any specific variable if you just um, well we've already attached the data right so if I say if I can type correctly summary carrot uh, it will you know we we can get information just for one variable this is base R but we're looking at the tidyverse because the tidyverse opens a gateway to more power basically um, so there's a command called summarize and it has a few variants um, so again we this is the short version this is just a pointer to say hey go look at dplyr and look at all the neat functions it has this is just one of lots of different variations um, we can do something very specific Right. and so let me explain what's happening here the syntax of 
dplyr commands. dplyr is like this core data manipulation package from the tidyverse is to use this funny looking symbol which is created by a percent and I'm not oriented correctly to my keyboard when I'm standing like this. Uh, it's percent greater than percent and that we refer to as the pipe because it connects to different things. So here I'm saying take the diamonds data set and when I look at that pipe symbol what I think of mentally is I think of and then. Take the diamonds data set and then summarize it. Now we're going to summarize the data if it is numeric. So we, we're not interested in those categories, the, the cut rating and things like that, because we want to get the mean va value. The mean doesn't is not meaningful for a categorical var val variable, but it is for a numeric variable. So we're testing, is it numeric? If it is, take the mean. And this third part is an option to remove missing data, not available data gets removed, gets RM removed. Um, and that's sometimes necessary to get clean results. A little so slight technicality, but one that you end up using quite a bit. So this is a command that runs over two lines. And now it's going to report for us just the mean value for each of the variables that are uh, numeric. Uh, as I said, this is just one example, right? We can we can combine these commands in lots of different ways, uh, report many different computations, um, but a starting point. So you can see how that works right here. Um, so RM removes items, uh, LS lists items. Um, there is a command here on line 73 that will remove all this, the files in your workspace so use it with care only when you're sure you want to do that. Other data operations in R, because R is designed, you know, around data are pretty straightforward. Let's say we want to compute a new variable for, for use in our analysis. We'd like to, to get the ratio of price to carrot. So we are going to define a name. We're going to say price per carrot is the name. This is on line 76. Um, and use our assignment operator and just write a formula on the right hand side. Basically anything can go on the right hand side. This is a simple formula price divided by caret. Now you'll notice that I'm using the dollar sign notation for the I'm referring to the full data set. This is something we need to be careful about. I didn't mention this the first time I talked about attach but you kind of need to know this because it, otherwise you'll be puzzled by what happens. Um, the attach function makes a copy of your data. The real data, so to speak, is still sitting there to be referred to in the long form. The diamonds data set, dollar sign, price per carat. When we attached it, we, we've got some second copy. That means we can't really change the copy. Right. We, in order to make a permanent change, we have to make the change to the original data set, which we do with the long notation that uses the dollar sign. Uh, and then to be sure that we use the new data, the new thing that we created, because uh, if I look at price per carat right now, if I ask for that, it's going to say, oh, can't find it. It's not there because it's not in the copy. Um, if we want to keep using the, the quick copy of the data, we have to attach it again. So I'm doing that here, and now I can actually get information about the price per carat. Okay, so now uh, we're going to see our first graph. Uh, this is the base R's plotting, just a simple plot command that shows up in the bottom right pane over here. Uh, plotting the variable by itself just sort of is like showing the distribution of how the data is, um, the range of the data. And the index here is just the sequence in which the data is reported. It's actually not terribly meaningful, um, although there does seem to be some pattern to it in this case. If I want to plot one thing against another, a typical scatter plot, I use this 
tilde notation, and the tilde appears um, in different places on, on different people's keyboards. Um, actually, in my case, it's, um, it's going to be sort of tucked away somewhere for me because um, I've got a compact keyboard. So um, the, the tilde, which is on a standard keyboard, is up at the top left of the keyboard um, is is used to express a relationship, right? So plot price per carat as related to or um, as a function of x. And so if I do that one, um, I'll see my new plot pop up in a moment. Uh, x is just a measure of the width of the diamond in this case. So we see that... Um, there is this sort of pattern where the X around seven appears to be where the very high priced diamonds um, show up. If the diamond's too far off of that proportion, it's not so expensive. I don't know what the reason for that is, but we can see those patterns. Okay, so that's our first little plot. Um, R also has a range of quick functions for descriptive statistics. So things like the standard deviation. Um, and I have so we can retrieve things like that. The, the variance, um, we of, often may want to use the, the NARM to remove missing data to make these things work. Median, quantiles, uh, all that basic stuff is easy to find. Uh, also things like a histogram, uh, which is available with the hist command to show you the distribution of the data. I keep moving my little cam out of the way here so you can see that. Actually, I'll put the cam up in the top right so that this panel is, is visible. Okay, so uh, also if we, we, we've been looking at the numeric variables, if we want to count the categorical variables, we can use the table function. Table of one variable just counts it. Table of two variables gives us a cross tab. So just put the two different variables inside the parentheses. Um, and then, of course, we're probably going to want to do some statistical testing, right? Why are we in R in the first place? Maybe that, that's probably the reason. Uh, so again, everything you can imagine that you've heard about in statistics is available in R somewhere in some package, but we're just going with like a couple of basic things here, a t-test and a regression to give you a quick example. These are a question of locating the right command. Uh, we saw searching for the chi-square and the help earlier. Uh, a t-test is just t.test and a t-test is testing whether our data is significantly different um, than some other value. Now, if we ask for a t-test on a particular data element, here I'm asking for it on price per carat, it's going to assume some defaults. The default is that it's going to assume is that we're testing whether the data is equal to zero or not. So here, and the, the measure of whether it's significant or not is the p-value. If the p-value is very small, we can conclude that it's, it's highly unlikely that it is... Um, that the hypothesis is uh, is true. We reject the hypothesis, right? So that the and we accept the alternative hypothesis. So here the p-value is really tiny. It's uh, lots of zeros. Those that's in scientific notation, um, and because this is price data, right? The price is never zero or less. It's always positive. In fact, it's it's got a confidence interval around about 4,000, right? Uh, that's reported here. So when you run these tests, it's going to report something like standard statistical output. Um, those should be things that if this is the kind of thing you're using, you've seen in a stats textbook somewhere um, how to interpret. And like all the other functions in R, we can adjust the behavior with parameters. So if I say t-test... Um, price per carat mu equals 4,000. I'm testing whether that variable is 
significantly different than 4,000. So in this case, it's about, you know, the confidence interval included 4,000. That's kind of a clue that it's not going to be significantly different. The p-value is too high and, and we're fine with that. We can also, you know, further adjust things, the confidence level, things like that, and view all of the options with the question mark, right? So the question mark shows us here the, um, the different things that can be done. Um, you might wonder why you know we used mu and not mean, which we did earlier. This is just another example of R has you know R is not consistent. Different people write different packages. The standard notation for a t-test in a textbook uses mu for the mean, so they decided they prefer to go with mu. Um, although in this case, uh, there are some cases where they have sort of bowed to reality and realized probably a lot of people are typing in mean and um, you can actually get away in this command with using mean. Whoops, if I, I typed meeb, which is not good at all. And actually, well, what's, what's interesting about that is I, I'm saying that, that we got away with it. Actually, we did not get away with it. It didn't generate an error, but actually it's still testing whether the true mean is equal to zero. So it allowed me to type this without correcting me, but um, actually to make a change, we need to adhere to the command and say mu. Um, this is another typical thing in R, is R often doesn't give a lot of feedback compared to other software you might be used to. So pay attention. Um, to what's going on there. Okay, so lots of things available. The other thing in the in the help, you'll see t-test. We can have a, a t-test that compares two groups. Um, all of those are avail available via options. So look in the options whenever you're not seeing um, the the function behave as you as you would like. So the t-test will does have a lot of um, subtleties that might need to be adjusted. Uh, those are all available in the help. Then we have a linear regression. Uh, linear regression, the base function is LM and all the other kinds of regressions that you might have heard of are available. Usual caveat, um, we're just doing the basics. So. We want to check whether price per carat can be explained as a function of x. Um, so we use that tilde symbol again to indicate a relationship. Price per carat is the um, response variable or the, um, the dependent variable, depending on how you want to describe it. And the x variable is the explanatory variable or the uh, independent variable. All right, I run that. And I get, in this case, a really surprisingly sparse output. Uh, we just get the coefficients on the regression, right? The regression is going to generate a line. We've got the intercept and the slope on the x uh, value. Um, just to note along the way, like if we wanted to run this without an intercept, we can add a minus 1 on the right, which is a signal that says run it without an intercept, meaning run the data through the origin or zero up through something else. Usually that's going to be a worse fit and et cetera. Okay, this is, you know, if you've looked at regression at all, this is not what you expect to see. You expect to see something that lets you measure whether it's significant or not, whether this regression actually explains uh, a lot of the variation. So to do that, we have to do in line 112, put a summary command around the regression. So this is a case where you know you need to do a little bit extra just to kind of get R to behave properly. Um, but if we do a summary of the regression, we will then get a more normal table that you might expect to see. And these probabilities here, the p-values indicate that these it is significant. Um, it explains um, reasonable amount of the variation. R squared is 0.62 and uh, we can go from there. Uh, kind of an aside is a, a useful thing in R is that 
you know, this may look like other stat software, but R is a programming language. So we can store lots of things and use them as programming objects. So we can store the result of a regression by giving it a name like we do on line 118. Uh, we can take a look and the names there show us that all these variables have been have been saved. The coefficients on the regression, the uh, residuals, the fitted values, all these things that relate to the model. Um, and we could use that to access specific elements just like we do any other R object. So reg output dollar sign residuals gives us the residual values of that regression. Um, we might do things like save a bunch of those for different versions of our model and then use them to compare in different ways. Um, just kind of gives us more power. Um, also along the way we can notice that just like standard deviation and variance and everything, there, there are a, a lot of useful quick functions that relate to regression. So if we want to predict, uh, get the predicted values quickly, we can say predict and then the regression object inside the parentheses. We can, if we want an out of a table analysis of variance, we can grab that. Um, and this is again a reason where you might want to save the regression just to make referring to those a bit easier. Um, we could equally well uh, type ANOVA uh, and of the regression command itself, but um, why not run the regression once, save it, and then do whatever you'd like with it. Um, and so plotting the uh, regression Exactly right. Here we go. Plotting the regression uh, brings up, this is not a re regression class or even close to it, but it brings up the diagnostic plots that you would usually use to evaluate the fit of the regression. So that's another very useful feature. Okay, so now I'm just going to like in, in five minutes talk about ggplot. We referred to dplyr as a great way to analyze data, and I encourage you to go and look at the other full session on that. ggplot is a great way of visualizing data, um, and I encourage you to look at the session on that one. Um, I'm just installing the supplemental package to manage some colors here, our color brewer, and loading that. Um, and we're going to stick with this diamonds data and I just want to explain the the philosophy or the setup of ggplot to get you started with that and then I would encourage you to kind of if you're doing data visualization to go further and look at more material there. Um, our base R we have seen uh, produces this sort of standard black and white scatter plot by default. Here I'm plotting the price of the diamonds versus the carat weight of the diamonds and if I need to make some changes or modifications, it's literally like a sketch on paper. I can layer things on top. I can ask for a regression line to be drawn. That's this AB line command. Specify the color, call equals red. And how am I drawing the line? I'm drawing the line as a linear regression. So here's like I just put the regression command inside. Um, but this is drawn in two steps. Right, we we actually it's it's it displays on screen, but it's not a manipulable object in other ways. In R Studio, we can use this export to save a particular image, um, so that we can use it outside of of R. Uh, and if we want to modify a base R plot, we pass a lot of parameters, like we have seen in all the other commands. If we want to put in X labels, titles change the colors. Uh, we Each of those is a separate comma and then the, the option and without going into detail about what each of those are. ggplot is very different. ggplot, the gg and ggplot stands for the grammar of graphics and it attempts to separate these semantic elements of what you're asking for in a way that eventually leads you to have greater power in what you can do, greater flexibility. Um, so a ggplot command, we look first one of those is here on 149. 
um, has a first segment that talks about what is the data that we're, that we're interested in. We're interested in the diamonds data. Uh, we have X being the carat weight, Y being the price. And the AES here stands for aesthetics. That's just a, kind of a quirk of ggplot is that we're, we, what we want to visualize, we want aesthetics of those data objects, right? So we, we see this AES pop up a bit. But this doesn't tell us how we want it to be graphed. We have to tell it in a separate step with a plus and then the name of the type of graphing. So the geom point is asking for points to be drawn and that's going to give us a standard scatter plot. So here's our price versus caret data. Now if we want to do other things with it, we, we use this kind of syntax. Uh, let's say we wanted to group the data in, we have these different ratings for clarity of the diamond. There are actually eight clarity ratings. I'd like to see price versus caret broken down that way. So I'd like the same scatter plots. I'd like geom point. It's really the same data. This part of the command is the same in line 151. But there's another command that allows us to facet the, the data. And I'm going to facet or group the data by the clarity variable. And that gives us this option. And so now we've got a nice little set of graphs that lets us see how are the price relationships different for each of those clarity ratings. Um, other things like in line 153, if we want to make modifications, um, sometimes we have to pay attention to which part of the command is, is relevant. If we want those dots to be not black, but colored in, and I'm going to ask for them to be colored in by the cut rating, right? There are five different cut ratings. So I should get five different colored dots, depending on which group they belong to. Uh, but because that's a, that's a command that affects the points, I ask for that option inside the geom point command. Right? So it's like a modifier of the points. So we, we have, so the options appear in different places. So here's our, our um, we've got a lot of points. They're sort of over plotted, but we can see that there are uh, different colors for different, um, different cut ratings. And it automatically has produced this nice little uh, key to um, which, which is which. Um, and so finally here, I'm, I'm really not gonna go, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit in just a second. Um, I'm not going to go into all the detail that's in the sample code, but um, if we want to reproduce what we just did with the base R, um, we, we can put all of those commands in different sections of the, the command, right? So we have labs. This is a new section for us, a new grammatical element. And all of the labels, all of the text that you see here is inserted in the labs. And we can see that the color of the points, the style of the printing character for the points is um, inside the geom point command. So, you know, that's a very quick, very, very quick uh, intro to the grammar of graphics, ggplot. But what is special about ggplot is that you can use the same syntax um, for many, many different types of graphs, right? So if we go to the website reference and you see all of the geoms, there are many, many different kinds of graphs and actually more than just what's here, there are extensions to it that fit in the same style. Um, so that learning the syntax is a little bit complicated the first time, but pays off in, in many, many ways because you can use it over and over with many different uh, styles of graphing. And I'm just going to skip ahead to this regression on line 186 to show you that this the grammar approach lets us very smoothly introduce um, additional layers on the graph. This is something that's a uh, bit finicky again in the base R, but here we just add another plus, right? So this is our scatter plot. 
but we've added a plus and we've said we would like to draw something smooth onto the the um, graph using the linear regression method and it automatically pops in the regression line um, we're not limited to a linear regression there's another technique called stat smooth that's going to provide a best fit curve through the data that sometimes will do a lot better in sort of explaining what's going on um, things like that right so that are actually once you've spotted that command very easy to do easier than with other methods okay so the final piece of this very rapid intro to everything and thank you for bearing with me through this this part is importing your data right so um, if we have text data uh, plain text data we can use read functions that are built into the tidyverse package called read r uh, the example on 207 to 209 i'm using this download file uh, command to grab something from my website that just so that everyone has a kind of standard file to look at very small file um, and i read it into r by naming a new data object arbitrary whatever name I like I like to use my data so it's clear that it's something I imported uh, is assigned by read TSV read underscore TSV and that's a tab separated file the one that I loaded here is a tab so you have to know a little bit about the format of the file you're bringing in but once you do that it's like a one-step function and we can look at it this is just a very tiny little sample data frame uh, read underscore CSV is maybe the most commonly used. I mean, I would recommend if you can use a comma separated file. Um, those are great. They're unambiguous. They're easy to use in many different programs. Uh, so comma separated file just means a text file with commas in between each of the columns of data. Um, and that's read underscore CSV. Um, just as an aside there's also a read.csv which is the base r version but the tidyverse version has some advantages which i go into in other videos if you look at my data ma manipulation videos um, so i kind of recommend use read underscore csv now even though we can say it's better to stay away from excel in reality many people use excel um, there's a package for that install the package read Excel that's the tidyverse way there are other there's several packages that that'll import Excel data but the tidyverse way is read Excel within this format all lowercase um, load it uh, take your Excel file and just use the command read underscore Excel um, with the name of the file over here and there's a, a little tweak 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 or twist which is this comma one and that's just recognizing that when you have a spreadsheet it may have multiple multiple sheets in one file so by default it's going to read the first one but maybe you don't want the first one maybe the first one has some description and the real data is on the third sheet um, you can use the number or you can use the name of this of that sheet as it's named in the file but it's only going to bring in one of those right it's not going to bring in multiple sheets because it's not going to know which object you'd have to name those as separate objects like my data one for sheet one my data two for sheet two things like that um, so this is again straightforward anything that you read into r can be written out in the same way there's a write excel command there and package there's a write csv so that's also the best way to save it and make it available in a general way to others without being tied to the R formats. Uh, and then in, in the code, you'll see notes on many, many, many other data packages that are useful for connecting to different types of data. Um, R is widely used in the data world. And so there are packages for pretty much everything. Um, and that's one of, one of the benefits of learning this ecosystem rather than you know one specific stats program that is not going to be as flexible in the long run um, 
there's more to the code. There's more videos that you can take a look at. Obviously, I'm not the only place to learn about R. There, there are many, many excellent sites out there. Um, so I'm going to link uh, in the video description to a guide to R material uh, that you could take a look at as well as, as these links. Um, and I'll stop here to keep this introduction a, a bit manageable um, as a one session introduction to R as best as I could, could give it. So thank you for your attention and